so excited to be here today with so many of you. I'm Romy Newman. I'm the co-founder of Fairy God Boss, and I am really humbled to be here today with Barbara Humpton, who is the U.S. CEO of Siemens. Barbara, welcome, and thank you for joining us here today. Oh, Romy, thank you so much. Siemens has been so delighted to actually partner with Fairy God Boss, and we love the work that we're doing together. So it's great to spend some time with you and so many viewers today. Well, you and your career and your experience really exemplify what Fairy God Boss is all about. You've had so much achievement. You've had such a robust career in the public private sector, and you've, uh, you've done that all with grace and, and um, supporting other women. So tell us about your career. I'm happy to. You know, it's funny because I think each of us are on such different paths and trajectories. And, and, and I fondly recall back in the day when I was asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was raised by two college professors who said, hey, it's really important to learn about everything. And I liked everything, science, math, the arts, history. It, it was all fun. And so when people ask that question, what do you want to be when you grow up? I kind of choked. And the answer that I often gave was, I want to be a grandmother. Wow. And, you know, that's it's really jumping ahead. <laughs> well, it's funny because, you know, often it was, it was my joking way to change the subject, you know, oh, that's ridiculous. But, but actually what it turned out to be was a wonderful mental aid to me as I proceeded through my career. I mean, I started out of college thinking I was going to be a math professor like my parents, but I took a little assignment at IBM learning to be a computer programmer and actually loved it, fell in love with it. And so as my career progressed in time, pardon me, must have been an incredible moment of time because that was really probably right at the beginning of computer programming was so hot and you were there first and probably one of the first women. Um, well, actually, what I learned from watching Hidden Figures is that women were actually really very present at the beginning of computer programming. Uh, yes, yes, I was there when computer programming was being invented, you know, in the early 1980s is when I started my career. And, you know, it was one of those, um, it was one of those roles where it, there was just constant learning. I think that was what was particularly fun for me. But it was also a job with a mission. It was a classified mission. I can't share what it was, but, but let that me just sounds say, very cool. <laughs> um, it, it helped end the Cold War, Romy, and and there was a moment. Let me tell just a quick story that that really cemented for me, um, kind of how I knew I was never going to be a college professor. Um, one day, the chief engineer of our project <clears throat> called all of the programmers together into a conference room and said, I need to tell you how our technology was used this past weekend. There was a fighter pilot in Eastern Europe who was shot down behind enemy lines and we weren't sure how he could be saved. But our technology was used to locate him and then we were able to successfully get him out of harm's way. And what I wanna share with everybody, this is what the chief engineer said. He said, that was my nephew. Oh, that's and for me, that was the moment that just nailed it for me. It, it was realizing that technology with a purpose is, is really what I want to be focused on. So a, a career that started with computer programming and then grew to uh, being a project manager and then a manager of project managers and ultimately an invitation to come to Siemens, when I look back on it, now I understand looking back and seeing the progression, it's really been all about really finding ways to use technology to expand what's humanly possible, to find new ways to enhance national security and now I'll say global security. So it's been incredibly fulfilling, but if you'd asked me at the beginning, where is this going? I had no idea. I just knew that when things got rough, I could say, well, my real goal is to be a grandmother. <laughs> uh, that's, that's incredibly inspiring. And uh, I'd, lo I'd love to actually ask, um, already going off script, but what's interesting to me is that fundamentally, computer programming is a very different discipline than managing 
teams and teams of co and company and strategy and organization of computer programming. Can you tell a little bit of, about the how you view that transition and what it's like to go from being an individual contributor to a manager and a manager of managers and manager of processes? Yeah. Um, actually, let me let me challenge that very first premise. You might think that being a computer programmer is something that is very solitary. And what shocked me when I began, uh, I was working on a massive, massive program. I mean, literally, there were hundreds of programmers all working together to achieve a really audacious goal. And, and what we all discovered is, oh, we may be spending 10% of our time actually doing computer programming. We're spending most of our time communicating, collaborating, working with engineers to figure out how are we going to accomplish this? Oh, and how is my piece going to fit with her piece? And then how do we explain this to a customer when, especially when we run into challenges? And so it, I guess, Romy, what I learned early on is that the gift I brought to the table was the gift of being able to bring people together in a setting where we could all be equals solving a problem. And then I could help explain, hey, here's what we discovered and here's our recommendation about where to go next. And it turns out that's a core skill that I've needed in every single role I've taken since then. I love and it's, it's the skill that I enjoy bringing to the table today at Siemens. That's wonderful. So like re real collaboration, empathy, uh, communication should, should pervade. It's pervasive. It's in everything we do and it needs to be in everything we do. That's right. So then tell us about Siemens and what attracted you to, to be there. And you've been there quite some time. Oh, I've now been here a decade and the time has just flown. I mean, honestly, this is a company that is doing incredible work in, in things that are tremendously meaningful. And, and let me tell you about that. Siemens is a business to society company. You know, you've heard B2B, business to business. You've heard B2C, business to consumer. What if the purpose of your company is to bring value to society? That, concept. That's Siemens, right? Now, what do we do? Uh, well, this is a company that has its business strategy built around global megatrends. Think about climate change, urbanization, aging demographics, the ever-increasing global supply chain, which is being challenged right now. And, and think about the digitalization of everything. Well, we at Siemens have expertise in electrification, automation, digitalization. We're working to address those global megatrends. And, and I'll tell you, it's really fascinating every single day to gather together with experts in healthcare, in energy, experts in manufacturing, experts in the built infrastructure of cities. These folks are, have, have deep expertise in things that are desperately needed by the nation now. So this whole why for me, this idea of, of really elevating the role of the human, bringing tools to the table that are going to make us more effective at addressing challenges, this is just a wonderful place for me to be personally. And when I look to my left and my right, I see colleagues who are every bit as, as inspired by the mission as I am. Well, I think that's wonderful, and, uh, and I'm inspired by what you're saying, and I also think it's, it's, um, it's very impressive that, and exciting that you're so willing to tackle these huge problems. I mean, uh, it's must, you must appre approach your workday quite differently because you're not checking boxes, right? <laughs> you're, you're focused on the really big things. Well, um, yeah, yes, please, Romy. So I'm interested to know, you do work today in a field that's really typically dominated by men. And we also know the statistics that in large global companies, CEOs are, are very infrequently, you know, less than 10% are mm -hmm. women. So how did you navigate the, both the workplace as a woman or as a, one of few women, and then also manage to raise a family at the same time? Mm -hmm. You know, this is such a great question and it's something I spend a lot of time talking about first, you know, obviously with the, the teams I work with day in and day out. And I love to share a perspective with as many people as I can. Um, think about the work-life blend instead of work-life balance. So yes, I started my career as a computer programmer and it was one of those things where 
um, there were a lot of women in the workplace. I had some fantastic role models. But even then, in the 1980s, um, the, the general wisdom was, hey, if you want to be, if you want to advance, if you want to rise in the organization, you're going to have to set aside family. Well, yeah, gosh, my biological clock just didn't work that way. I fell in love with David Humpton. We got married right out of college. We had our first child, our beautiful daughter, two years after that. And, and Charlie came along three years after that. And I mean, the, everything just snowballed, right? So, so we had a family early on. And, and, and there were a lot of people who said, hmm, you know, that's not the choice I'm making. So now, by the way, I have a lot of peers who have teenage children, whereas I'm a happy grandmother. Well, early, I guess, mid-career at that time when, you know, people were starting to say, hey, how will I advance? What I was finding is I was staying in positions for a pretty lengthy amount of time. Right, I, I would get onto a project, I would stay with that project, I would see it through. I actually had a mentor assigned to me at a certain point and he literally sat me down one day and said, well, you know, Barbara, you're gonna have to choose between being an executive and a mother. And I thought to myself, I'm not sure he realizes I already have two children, right? That choice has already been made, that train has left the station. So back then, I think, a lot of us, you know, listen to voices of authority that way and just thought, well, that must just be my fate. Maybe that's just the way it is. And, and so for me, what that spelled was, well, just throw yourself into your work, right? My husband, Dave, would say, Barb, you love what you do. Just, you know, hey, th enjoy it. And, and it was great advice because I got to work on things like the global positioning system and, and biometrics with the FBI, right? It's, it, 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 they were fascinating, fascinating fields. And the fact that I was spending time in each assignment meant that there was time for me to make mistakes, mess things up, and then learn to clean up the mess. So by the time that, you know, attitudes started to change and people started to look differently at women as you know, maybe we're missing something. Maybe, maybe there's more that these uh, women in our organization have to offer. Have we considered Barb as somebody who might make a, good, you know, a good, uh, uh, I'll say, junior executive in our team? Um, when I started to get those opportunities for interviews, by then I had the kind of experience, dirt under my fingernails, that meant you know I was able to work effectively with people from all kinds of different roles. Um, I, I just, I really think it's something that we all should consider. Careers are longer now. Don't be in too much of a rush to, to quote, move ahead. It's a marathon. Not yeah, a well, the, the thing I like to talk about with our team, Romy, is a lot of people need to think about which way is up, yeah. right? Are we, if we, if we're climbing a ladder, are we trying to climb up the executive management chain or are we really trying to go deep in an area of technology? Or are we trying to go out closer to customers? I mean, there are just so many directions a career can take and we shouldn't feel the rush of time. I love that advice. Really and then build our skills. Somehow that sort of tunneling gets you elevated uh, because clearly it was through your track record of achievement that you were identified for new opportunities. Is that right? Yeah, uh, the way I like to think about it is, you know, when people ask that question, hey, who can help us? I, my name often popped to the top of the list because I wasn't shy about raising my hand for hard, uh, for hard assignments. Um, when the global positioning system was in terrible, terrible trouble, behind schedule, way over budget. I mean, we were in a situation where our contract terms caused IBM to be paying half of all of the costs of development because we had exceeded the budget um, cap. I, you know, th it, was, it was a horrible, horrible project situation to step into. I took that assignment and, and helped the team rally around and figure out how do we build a plan that, that's actually gonna achieve the end goal and, and, and get us done, because getting done was the, the key. Well, you go through a few of those things, you have those kind of foxhole experiences and you learn who you can count on, uh, who do you like to work with. So I think I got some of my opportunities uh, literally because, uh, you know, I was recognized as somebody willing to take on some hard assignments. Yeah, I think that I hear that a lot um, from accomplished women. You, you were willing to take on the hardest or least desirable assignments 
also though a reputation for for solving problems mm -hmm. willingness to solve problems um and and um and again that sort of building a reputation having a reputation that this is a person who's helpful and great to work with and gets things done um so that's what helped you become the ceo but what what you really did was achieve your greatest ambition you became a grandmother <laughs> <laughs> almost simultaneously <laughs> that's, and that's an, a truly amazing story so what does work life balance look for like for you today and i'm going to ask that question in two todays today like pre march 12th <laughs> and then today we are all working from home you and i are working from home how do you manage the work life balance in the in the you know in the big picture and then in this crazy strange world we're living in yeah yeah <laughs> and again i'll i'll bring back the topic of work life blend at, at siemens one of the things that we are really um open to is people working virtually you know we're a global company so we were already working with colleagues all over the place it was absolutely natural for instance to have a mentoring group meeting via video teleconference with you know people in five different states and, and that was that was working. Um, I just, I pulled up my calendar from uh, January. I don't know why I was feeling nostalgic the other day and just <laughs> open up the calendar to say, hey, you know, what, what did things look like a couple of months ago? And it was crazy, Romy. You know, it was, uh, you know, Monday in New York, Tuesday in San Francisco, it, a lot of flying from here to there because because what we really wanted was to be physically present, um, to be able to be with large groups of people. I mean, in the first few weeks of the year, I was at the Consumer Electronics Show at Dreamforce at significant events in New York and, and, and loving it, loving it. And then it's loving to use technology to stay in touch with the family and grandchildren. Uh, Dave and I both love weekends with family. You know, we are, the whole clan now is here in the Washington area. So it's wonderful to be able to be Grandma Barb on the weekend and, and go visit local parks and, and just hang out with the kids. Fast forward, you know, March, um, actually, I'll share with everybody, I actually came down with a fever at the end of February and isolated. So I've actually been locked in this apartment now for, for a little bit longer than, than a lot of you have been in your own areas. Um, but, but in the middle of March when everything shut down and the question was how do we interact, um, two sort of phenomenal things happened. Um, our kids introduced us to the joys of family FaceTime meetings and at an early family happy hour on a Friday night, our son and daughter-in-law let us know that they're expecting their first child in October. Oh, that's so exciting. I think it is. And tomorrow we'll be having what they're calling a parking lot party where they're going to do the gender reveal. And so that's we just so we can't wait for that. Um, our little grandchildren, what they started doing, you know, the DC scene was almost post-apocalyptic, right? There was nobody in town. And, um, and our son-in-law would take these two little boys, four and two, um, scooting all around DC on their little scooters. And they took fantastic pictures. What they started doing was taking pictures of themselves in front of a major, you know, uh, uh, monument or a sculpture or something, you know, guess where we are, grandma. And then my challenge was to find a way to get there the next day and send them a picture and say, aha, you were at the Albert Einstein Memorial. Or you were at the, at the Washington Monument. So we've had, we found ways to make games of it all and to, um, to actually stay in touch. That's very creative and wonderful. And I hope you get to see them soon. Um, but I also love the gender reveal party. And one thing I've been thinking a lot about is we all have to find ways to help people find joy in this. So uh, the more we can do that, the better. Um, so kind of back to the workplace. Mm -hmm. you, um, knowing what you know, having been through what you've been through, what do you think organizations can and should do systematically to help advance and support female talent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, um, this is a real puzzle, right? I mean, you think about it, we talk about it a lot. And we measure, measure, measure. And yet year after year, we're, we're not seeing the progress we want to so see. Slow. I'm almost wondering if this is a moment that is going to change everything. 
I'm wondering if actually what we're learning in this moment where we can't be physically together might change the balance of things a little bit. I mean, is this a, is this a, a situation and is this a future that we're building where a person's ability to communicate, to connect, to feel empathy and express it, to nurture, things that we often think of as the gifts that women bring to the world. Is this a moment where those suddenly rise as some of the most important qualities of leadership? We may very well be there. You know, many of the situations that lead to the micro inequities that have stifled us, women and minorities and, and, and men of certain personalities, right? This isn't, this is by no means, um, you know, limited to, to women. What, what I found is that there usually has been some sort of model of what, what our ideal leader will look like, right? Every organization kind of has it. The big question is, do you have what it takes, yeah. right? Well, what is it? Are women a better crisis leader? In general, well, right? Yeah, right. And so, so in the past, where you might have found that um, a, a, the ability to hang with the boys, the ability to, oh, back in the 80s and 90s, it was who plays golf well. You know, there were all those kind of classic things where you thought, wow, I don't, I don't do any of those things. How am I ever going to be noticed? How will I build my network? How can I, how can I be in? Well, gosh, right? We're in a moment where we can't do many of those things right now. So why don't we use this moment to sort of change the way it works? Why don't we use this to create a different future? And I'll, I'll share with you that just this morning I was talking with Pooja and I'm our head of talent for the US. Uh, she and I have a monthly one-on-one -on -one where we just, you know, we talk about how we are working on exactly this issue within the Siemens Corporation. And, and she's been fantastic about helping to devise new ways of mentoring, new, new ways to bring us together. Today, our brainstorm was built around two things. One, what kind of influence do we have at the global level for Siemens? And it's kind of inspiring to see what she and others in our organization are doing as we build relationships during the crisis. But then secondly, we're using different tools why instead of saying let's find the virtual equivalent of let's ask a different question how do these tools help us connect to those talents who've not yet had a chance to rise or to shine in our current organization so simple things like networking in ways that will draw people into positions of shaping our business strategy around the future of all those things we're focused on climate change etc Drawing on individuals' capabilities in this virtual world, I think it's going to be a game changer. I love that. And I hope you're right. And I love your optimism. Um, I've spoken with a few different groups this week. And a common theme I'm hearing is there's anxiety about whether our work can be seen in the same way. Um, we're not presenting in front of big meetings. Uh, we have interruptions. We have interruptions, like my eight-year-old walking in. Sorry, everybody. I love um, it. We, you know, we're we're. Okay, he, he's done. This is the work-life blend, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Um, but so, um, you know, so so there's this idea that I I'm not connecting with my manager in the same way. My manager can't see my work. I don't even know what my manager is expecting. How will I rise? How will I have the same sort of track record where everyone knew that you, Barbara, were the person to solve? How do you build a reputation in this virtual world? Yeah. Yeah. Go, go take care of that. I'll explain to everybody. No, <laughs> no the, um, so this, this was a great question before COVID and it's a great question now um, because, you know, there's that real question of does my work speak for itself or do I need to speak up? Right. Um, and I think this is one reason. And women. Pardon me? Is it different for men and women? Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. A great question. I, I'm going to, I'll put a different spin on, which, on it, which is, well, it's different with different personality types. Right. I, I, men and women both can be the sort of folks who toot their own horn or the folks who feel that their work speaks for itself. 
And so I, I think this is one reason I was always drawn to those, you know, dramatic crisis type projects and moments because there the work speaks for itself and you often have to be the mouthpiece for the work. So you naturally get a stage. I, I'll share with you that right now, um, it has been a period within Siemens where unlike any time in, in the last 10 years since I've been here, we have really tight communication globally. And because I'm leading the, the largest market that we have with 25% of Siemens business done right here in the US, there's a natural need for me to speak up. So these are the moments that I, I seek out. You know, it's, um, some people say, let no crisis go to waste, right? <laughs> well, well, yeah, this is a moment when our voice matters. Our voice as the US matters. So, so as, as folks are thinking about the own, their own roles that they play, I think it's a simple thing to sort of ask, does my work speak for itself? Or do I also need to take some extra steps to elevate and highlight the work? And, and I do think it's one of those situations where it makes sense for us to, to actually reach out proactively. Um, you know, there's an equivalent to somebody stopping by and sticking their head in my office. Not first, I get a text message, hey, got a minute? And the next thing is then an actual hopping on to a video conference to talk to each other. Ann Fairchild, our general counsel and I, that's our favorite mode of operation. Hey, got a minute? And, and then the chance to actually just see each other face to face. So I, I think for people who are feeling a little bit isolated, I'd, I'd let your heart tell you whether you need that connectivity. And then if you're leading other people, remember that they need you more than ever right now and, and make yourself available. We've all got different, um, different management styles. Now it looks to me like we may have lost Romy we, we may have. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Marion with the Fairy God Boss team. So we'll just chime in right here. Um, as we're all seeing interruptions in this virtual world happen. Um, so thank you for your flexibility, Barbara, and candidness. We just so appreciate having you and would love to continue the conversation. Um, and I know we have about 30 minutes left. So just wanted to remind people as well that we want to try and save some time to answer questions. Um, so if you do have a question for Barbara, please feel free to drop it in the Q&A and we will try to answer as many as we can um, at the end. And Barbara, I love what you were just saying. I think women definitely struggle in particular to um, brag and highlight what they're doing um, in their careers. And, you know, this virtual world um, does make it a little bit more difficult to showcase those accomplishments, but your advice was, was so valuable. Um, and just piggybacking on advice, you've obviously had a tremendous career in technology. So for young women just starting out in their careers, what advice do you have for them, particularly in this, this uncertain time we find ourselves in? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, you know, statement number one, be you. Um, I think a lot of us, as we get started out in our careers, we wonder what we, quote, need to be. And we're looking for role models. We're looking for sort of templates to follow. Um, but, but the coolest thing these days is that doors are open to all of us. Um, employers are seeking diversity. They're seeking different view, viewpoints, perspectives, talent sets. So, so embrace what, what you uniquely bring to a job. Um, something that I wish I would have learned much, much, much earlier in my career is that there is an absolute correlation between joy and real success at what you do. Um, and I, it was funny because I think I was raised in that time when people said, well, work is work. Work is supposed to be hard. Um, improving yourself is hard work. You know, all of that, that whole narrative that runs through your head that, oh, if it's not hurting, if it's not uncomfortable, then I must not be doing it right. And I can attest to this fact that, you know, each of us has things that we love to do, things that make us lose track of time. You know, when, when I get started, I'll, I'll share with you, this is one of those things. When I get started talking to a group of people, I lose track of time. I'm in the zone. I, I feel joy. And, and so what I've been encouraging people to do is really pay attention to 
what brings them joy and find ways to do more of that. I mean, you'll find that in any kind of job, there are things you can do yourself and there are things you can delegate to others. You can ask colleagues to help with and offload those things that don't bring you joy. Find somebody who does find joy in those things and, and spend more and more and more of your time focused on joy. Because if you can get that kind of alignment, well, I'm working for an organization that is aligned with the things I believe in and stand for, then you can bring more of that joy, which turns into productivity and excellence, and it, it shows through in the things that you do every day. I love that. If I could, That's... if I could just leave, you know, that one piece of advice. If there were one thing that people were going to take away from today, it would be that. I absolutely love that, Barbara. And you're so right. We spend so much of our our time working and you should enjoy what you're doing, um, the projects and the people and the company mission that you surround yourself with. So thank you so much for sharing that. I think that's a, such a great reminder, um, particularly as we're all feeling the stress of the current pandemic. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, you know, and, and in line with what we're all experiencing um, with the new realities of working from home, you know, Siemens in particular is such a leader and, and gender diversity and inclusion. And so how do we prevent the current situation um, as leaders from impacting our diversity goals and initiatives? And how can we prioritize this in this tough time? Well, okay, first of all, I'm gonna quote Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks, data, data, data. Uh, I actually think one of the keys to managing anything is understanding what you're dealing with. And so I love the idea of making diversity a major platform for the company. Nichelle Grant in our organization is our chief uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity officer. She's really working with the U.S. leadership team day in and day out trying to make sure that we understand where do we stand, how are our actions impacting results, and, and then she's keeping us talking about this, uh, both inside and outside the company. You can look for Nichelle on social media, and you'll find her telling the story of the ways we're engaging. And, and what we're hoping when we do that is that we're reaching an audience that would say, ooh, I'd like to be part of that. I mean, to be quite honest, this is one of our major motivators for joining forces with Fairy Godboss. We're looking for people who have an interest in the kind of mission that, that we're pursuing, hoping to recruit you into our organization. So I actually think that as a leadership team, we need to be conscious. We need to, to be aware that this is a goal that we have. Keep it front and center and keep talking about it. Great, I love that. Thank you for, for sharing. And it, it's clear your leadership, Barbara, is so invaluable to the organization and making uh, gender diversity a priority. Um, and so it looks like Romy is back. Mary, um, thank you so much for stepping in. I had a, I was, I had a feeling, I said, Mary, in case my internet goes out. Thank you. <laughs> thank yeah, you. Yeah, of course. We were just um, chatting about how um, leaders, particularly in this time, can keep gender diversity and inclusion a priority. Um, and Barbara was sharing her thoughts on that. And so, um, we have one more question for you, Barbara, and then I was hoping we could open it up to Q&A and I'll hand it back over to Romy if that sounds good. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the last question, you know, it's a bit of a fairy god boss tradition where we encourage women to brag um, because data shows they don't brag about their achieve achievements enough and we've touched a little bit um, on that throughout this conversation. And you were clearly so accomplished and just so, um, just so admirable to hear your, your story. But what we want to know, what do you think is your biggest accomplishment? I believe that my biggest accomplishment is not yet visible. I, I've had an amazing opportunity to help build the global positioning system, to help bring biometrics to the FBI, right? To, to help with border security. Now at Siemens, working on the transformation of the electric grid and the, the future of renewable energy. I get to be part of all that. But, but the thing that 
is most surprising to me is what happens when other people feel empowered and get inspired to go be creative as well. And I'll, I'll harken back to Pooja this morning. Pooja showed me something. She said, uh, the last time we had a meeting, you said this, and here's what I did with it. And I'm telling you, I almost burst into tears. To, to see that actions that I can take today in a role that I have is enabling other people to do incredibly impactful things means the best is yet to come. Barbara, you are so inspiring, <laughs> really, and positive. I, I just, uh, I think I need like a morning dose of it hey, every day. <laughs> bring it up, bring it up. <laughs> I love it. Well, please send in your questions. I'm going to start with one and then we'll let everybody else ask while they come in, but please send in your questions. My question is, you're solving huge problems. How do you, and you, you've just said how important creativity is, but how can you handle the huge to-do list and manage the, the things, the backlog and the tech, all the things that must get done today and still leave room for that creativity. Mm -hmm. um, did I mention we have 50,000 employees across the United States? <laughs> hey, here's a little secret for anybody who's in management. The people in our organizations want to do more. The people in our organizations are building their skills and want to stretch and try new things. And so, you know, one of the best things we can do is actually give away things that are on our to-do list. Give them away. Let somebody else learn and grow by handling this. Um, I shared with you, Romy, that I was actually sick at the end of February. I mean, sick. I, it's the first time in years that I literally just couldn't even pick up the phone and dial into a meeting. And when I finally came out of that fog, what I discovered is that our team, led by Mike Bokina, who heads human resources for the US, had already put together our COVID plan. I mean, this was before the start of March. They had a working group already underway and they were rocking and rolling. And what they said to me is, all you need to do is get better. <laughs> so, so, you know, I think it's one of those important things to think about is, uh, you know, I don't care what job any of us are doing, it, it will never overwhelm us. It, it, as long as, as long as we allow a team to help us through it. Romy, I, I love it, engaging our team and, and help, helping them be part of the process. Sure. So, um, kind of on the flip side of that, the question that came from the audience is, how did you know as an employee when it was time to stretch and ask for more versus when it was time to sort of hunker down? That is such a great question because I will tell you this. Again, I was raised in, I, I was raised in Lexington, Virginia, and I was taught to be a lady. And so throughout my career, literally every move came as an invitation. Barbara, would you like to be considered for a position as? And, and then I got deeply, deeply engaged in every role I had. I felt like every role I had at that moment was the most important role in the company. I mean, it was, it was a weird kind of thing, but I just, I, I literally was not raising my hand for things. I was being asked to go to do things that needed to be done. Great. So fast forward. Um, three years ago, two years ago now, gosh, yeah, it's only been two years. Um, I, was, I was serving as the CEO of Siemens Government Technologies and the position of CEO of Siemens US opened up. It was the first time in my career that I raised my hand. Wow, that's I, a great story. I, I actually, we, we have a global meeting at, that kicks off every new fiscal year. So this would have been about two and a half years ago. Our global CEO, Joe Kayser, was at the evening reception. I walked over to him and I said, Joe, we're all going to miss Judy Marks, who was my predecessor, but I'm here and I'm ready. Just let me know if you need me. And he said, um, he looked me deep in the eye and said, great. I, thank you, Barb, but uh, we're not going to fill the role. And I thought to myself, 
what do I say now? And what I, what I asked him was, well, how can I help, right? The, the US is an important market, how can I help? And he said, support Camille and Anne, Camille leading communications, now corporate affairs, and, and Anne, our general counsel I mentioned, they, they were both instrumental in leading the US organization then. And, and so I reached out to them and said, how can I help? Well, let me just share. A few months later, I, I got a phone call and it was, we're considering filling this job after all, would you like to be considered? And my answer was, would I? <laughs> So yeah, it's a, the first time in my whole career I raised my hand. <laughs> Should have learned I, a little earlier, don't you think? <laughs> well, well, it actually, I mean, it seems like whatever you've done has worked pretty well. Oh. Uh, but um, I love that idea, how can I help? Mm -hmm. And I think those are magical words mm -hmm. that um, can always be used more. Mm -hmm. um, because there's so many things that you're communicating when you say that. I have bandwidth, I have ambition, I have interest, um, and that just helps your, you be identified. Someone specifically asked that type of question. We talked about this a little bit, but I'm very fascinated with this idea that men and women face often face different promotion standards. Mm -hmm. This came from McKinsey, that um, women are more likely to be promoted based on their accomplishments or their past performance, based on men or men versus versus men more likely to be promoted based on what someone thinks they could accomplish. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you aren't being noticed, if, if you're a woman and you're not being noticed, if your performance or achievements are not helping you get that promotion, what would you recommend to someone who's facing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, and this happens both, you know, in overt ways as well as very, very hidden ways. Um, gosh, I, I, if I remember in the middle of my career being told by a boss that you realize that you could have, should have been a, a math teacher. You know, it's because of you taking this job that could have fed a family um, that our kids are not getting the education in mathematics that they actually, you know, so there's that kind of thing that happens where you ask yourself, is my contribution being valued here? Does, does, does anybody else think this is crazy? So I, I get it that there are those moments where you go, what is this perspective of, that people have of me? I, I'm gonna suggest that I've experienced this too, right? And what, what worked for me throughout my career, whenever I got in that kind of moment of doubt and wondering what do I do next, it was really important for me to listen to the voices inside my head because be careful if they're saying, um, gee, others won't let me, others aren't noticing, um, I'm not appreciated. It's a soundtrack that can get into your psyche and actually affect whether or not you're feeling that joy that actually makes you work most effectively. I mean, so, so try, Try replacing that worry with something else. And here's, well, here's, here's what I'd suggest. Um, for me, my biggest anxiety was always, do I have a seat at the table? And, and folks on my team will know that I still suffer from this from time to time. Have I been invited to the right things? Is my voice being heard in the right forms? And every single time, the right answer to this is, well, what table am I setting and who am I inviting into the conversation? Let's go make things happen instead of waiting for people to invite us in. And I love that. Well, it works, it works every time. What and can it, I do instead of what's happening to me? And it's, it's um, your story of how you became CEO is told completely exemplar, uh, exemplary of that because really you heard no first, but then you just made it a yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Now that I think about it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that. That's wonderful. Um, you, you alluded to this a little bit, um, and, and I think we had a, a couple case studies of it here on this call. Um, but do we think companies will change the way that remote working works and workplaces work and working parents work? in the wake of COVID, will expectations change? Uh, will there be more ability to work from home? What do you think lies ahead? Well, I think first of all, in the immediate future, and by immediate, I mean for the next probably 18 months, we don't have a choice. 
we don't have a choice. I think those who can work from home should in order to make sure we don't strain the healthcare systems as you know, we're gonna have to deal with the pandemic. It's just a fact of life. So I think that's making us um, ask a lot of questions just like you've already raised and, and viewers have raised, you know, how, how do we make sure that we're being present, intentional, conscious of the, the way we're doing business so that we can be equitable with people? Um, we don't have a choice. And then I just heard a, a quote from somebody earlier this week. I wish I could remember who it was, but it was like the first data is starting to pull in, pour in that says, do you know what? We're actually more productive working this way. Well, when people discover that they can actually get more done this way, I think you know, there may be a real business imperative to say, hey, I want people in situations where they can tune out distractions and, and get into the zone and be productive. Uh, you know, like right? little data to support it. <laughs> and so business results will have a big impact on, on how this goes. But there's one other thing I think we need to just step back and realize it's going to take some time for us to understand. I mean, what is the mental impact on all of us to be separated, you know, not to be in our wonderfully social environments? I, we won't know. We won't know for a little while and we have to be very careful as we go forward because there are new kinds of, you know, I'll call, um, emotional strain and stress that we need to be on the lookout for. I, you know, I, I have the pleasure of being here in a very comfortable apartment with the man I fell in love with 37 years ago. You know, we were quarantined together and yeah, life is good. But I realize there are people juggling incredibly difficult situations right now. And so we, we've got to really hear, we've got to hear back from people about how this is working for them. And then, as I say, I think we can alleviate a lot of the strain on our, our societal systems if more of us choose to work from home. And, and the question is, what will we have to do? Right, right. Switching gears a little bit, um, we have some people on our call who've been furloughed or laid off what advice do you have for them about how to undertake a job search? And specifically, the question is how, frankly, how selective should they be um, versus just having, you know, should they really try to evaluate, trying to work for the kind of place they want to work? Or is this a time just to find a paycheck? Mm. Well, both, right? We all have, we all work within a hierarchy of needs. You know, first, let's make sure we, uh, t uh, we attend to the safety, security needs of our families and ourselves. Um, and, and so if that means we have to do something, um, and even if it's not the ideal position that we want, then by Joe, do it. Um, I've got a picture on my, I've got a book on my bookshelf, Nelson Mandela. Um, if you haven't read his uh, Long Walk to Freedom, right, what, what you'll find is that each of us is resilient in ways we, can, we cannot even imagine. And so, yeah, again, I, I hope that those of you who are on furlough are, are recognizing that your most powerful tool is within you. It's that, it's that attitude of taking control of the things that are in your control. Um, you know, I, even I, I've got a real, I've got, I've got a role that I've got to play right now, which is um, important. And I kept thinking early on that, well, this will just, you know, consume my whole focus. I'm finding even in this role, I've got that, those moments of the scatterbrained, you know, white noise, like what's happening, I've got to tune into the news and, you know, and get updated on what's happening. I realize it's incredibly hard to focus when we're in the midst of of a pandemic, of a crisis of any sort, but this pandemic. And, and what I hope is that people who are being furloughed find it within themselves and an ability to focus to perhaps develop some new skills. Um, one of the things I would encourage everybody who, who has an, a, a hankering to do this, to get on board with getting an education on cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is going to be a field that will be uh, looking to ramp up rapidly in the coming months. And I, I, there are ways to pursue um, through a series of micro credentials, 
uh, qualifications that would prepare you for jobs in that field. Beyond that, I believe that digitalization is sweeping in in a big way and here in the US around the world, we'll see a lot of um, things that have been very um, that have been uh, very analog driven in the past will become digital. So anything that you can do to get familiar with programming. Uh, I'll point you to Mendix, a Siemens company, where it's software that empowers normal <laughs> citizens, mere mortals, even me, to be software developers. And, and um, so perhaps there are toolkits available today where you can get in on the ground floor uh, start using some of the new tools of a future that has more elevated automation in it, and you'll be prepared to play important roles for growing industries in the coming months. I love it. Uh, we're almost out of time, and we've had so many wonderful questions come in, and I'm sorry that we can't answer them all. I'm going to give you two more, uh, and so I'm afraid everyone else, I'm sorry we're not able to answer your questions. Uh, but I, uh, I do want to just let you know, Barbara, that everyone in the, the chat feels the way that I feel, which is talking to you is just so inspirational. <laughs> We're all feeling very inspired. So two last uh, questions. One is, uh, besides skill development, if, if we're an ambitious female executive, what we, we talked a little bit about traits that will win in the future. What traits around management or leadership do you think are most important to develop? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Something that uh, Mike and I have been talking about in the development of our uh, organization at Siemens is, uh, we call it the, uh, the triple whammy, IQ, right, is are you smart? Second, EQ, right, can you relate? And then the third is DQ, not disqualified, but digital quotient. So uh, intelligence and emotional and a digital quotient. Um, you know, don't be afraid to embrace the tools of the future. Now, one of the things I like to say, and I'll, I'll say this here, and this may sound trite, but it, bear with me. The only two characteristics you need are curiosity and initiative. Keep learning and then take the initiative to get engaged. Who knows what you'll build? I love it. So then the last question mm -hmm. is from someone, we've got a few people who want to come work for you as soon as possible. <laughs> and the question is, what does Siemens look for in a potential candidate? Oh, wow. You know, it, this really varies across our many businesses. Um, it, it, this is, and this is one of the fun things about Siemens because you sort of ask, what do we need? And the answer is everything. Now, we, like many other companies, are right now going through a period of great uncertainty. Before the COVID crisis hit, we had 3,000 open positions across the US. So, you know, hovering at about 52,000 employees with the goal of getting to 55,000. I mean, it's, it's a large workforce. And in that mix is everything from people who are experts at electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, computer programming, to people who are experts at, you know, data analytics, what I'm finding is that you know, we've got these great search engines that can help us look for the capabilities uh, within the open job positions at Siemens and then the locations, et cetera. And, and so it's been a great tool for people to be able to go in and, and kind of see uh, where's my match. One of the biggest challenges I think we have at Siemens, and I think this is one of those big um, things that all organizations have to deal with is um, hiring managers who have a perspective that say, I know what I'm looking for. You know, my ideal candidate looks like dot, dot, dot. And, you know, in general, the true secret is the, the end of that sentence is looks like me, right? I, I want somebody who gets me <laughs> and I want somebody who I'll get. And so I think one of the most important things for people as they come and, and actually go through the interviewing process with us at Siemens is, is to go ahead, be yourself, but also try to get to know the, the personality of the interviewer. Make sure that when you come to us, you can tell us, you can give us examples of how you have worked and accomplished, what, how you've solved problems, how you've networked with people in ways that align with 
the things we're trying to do. It takes a little bit of extra research to get ready because how could you possibly know the problem we're trying to solve? But if you can dig a little bit into that and present yourself as the answer to a tough problem that we've got to solve, that can really be a game changer in the dialogue that occurs between us. I love it. I've really learned so much from you today, Barbara. And I think if I were to summarize, there's this whole, um, if you're curious and you volunteer to solve the hard problems, your career will just happen. And <laughs> maybe that's simplifying it a little bit, but yeah. I, I, think, I think that's what I've taken away from you. And I also think what I've taken away from you is how important optimism, positivity, possibility is to leadership and management. So thank you so much for spending time with us here today. And I'm going to just echo the, one of the last questions we received is, can we do this again with Barbara? <laughs> I'll be here anytime. You know where to find me. <laughs> well, so stay tuned for episode two at some later date. Barbara, thank you so much. Wishing you health um, and safety in this difficult time. And thank you for being at the forefront of solving so many of our nations and global uh, heart problems. And uh, good luck at the gender reveal party. That sounds really exciting. I can't wait. Well, Romy, thank you. And thank you for all you and what Fairy God Boss, Boss does for so many people. Thank you. Wonderful spending time with you. Thanks. Bye.